Uh, hi there, uh, Amy Wax. How are you doing? I'm fine. Happy my summer. old friend, my old friend, <laughs> Amy Wax. <laughs> old in all senses. Okay, this is the Glenn Show. I am Glenn Lowry. I'm a professor at Brown University, professor of economics, and the uh, and I am also a professor of international public affairs with the Watson Institute uh, at Brown, which sponsors the Glenn Show. Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv, talking to Amy Wax, who's professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania and a uh, frequent uh, a guest in the past um, on more than one occasion here at the Glenn Show where we've talked about various things. Uh, so welcome to the Glenn Show, Amy. Thank you. Glad to be on. You are infamous. The, the, reason that, <laughs> the reason that we're laughing here is because I was saying, I said, Amy is my friend. And I wonder, dare I say that on the air? Because now I will be associated with a notorious racist and uh, I don't know, I don't know, maybe I, I will be, uh, you know, somehow blacklisted or something like that. But you are my friend. I'm not ashamed to say that. And, and uh, you are a controversialist, Amy. I mean, it seems like the controversy just swirls around you. We could review the bidding. Uh, but, uh, well, I mean, you know. You, uh, uh, and I like to say it's not about me. It's oh, not you think about not. me. You think well, not? I'm just a speed bump on the way to the suicide of the West. That's all. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you were removed as a teacher in a first year law class that's required for uh, law students at Penn in a controversy after you made a remark here at the Glenn Show about the relative performance of students by race and your experience in your classroom. And, uh, People were calling for your head on a platter. And what was that? That was just a year ago, it seems. Right. Uh, yeah. And um, they, they got a bit of my head on the platter. They, they took away my first year class, civil procedure, <laughs> because they thought the students would be traumatized if they had to uh, hear from me about civil procedure and uh, that they couldn't be sure I wasn't biased against them, even though, of course, grading is blind at University of Pennsylvania Law School. So if I'd want to be biased in my grading of them, it would be very difficult for me to do that. But facts can't be allowed to get in the way. So that's basically the status quo uh, as of this time. Uh, we're going to get on to the current controversy, but just with respect to that, Amy, and we've talked about it here more than once at the Glenn Show, so I don't want to dwell. But isn't the offense... Isn't your offense in that uh, case that you would dare to explicitly compare the performance of your students by race? Uh, that is like the first order offense. Then there's a second question of whether or not conditional on having committed that offense, the facts you report or the uh, surmises that you uh, convey uh, are valid. But the offense, is the offense not just simply the fact of talking about that thing? And I think if so, that's something that's really significant to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm not sure what the rules should be about what one talks about and what wasn't, doesn't and how one should. I'm prepared to consider a deliberation about rules. I think perhaps rules might be necessary, but I don't know exactly what they should be. And you seem to have run afoul of an implicit rule that this is simply something that's not discussed. Well, I mean, it's a complex topic because it also relates to something we, we don't really have time to get into, which is, you know, these elaborate confidentiality rules and how broadly that they're construed. I think they're construed way too broadly and they've become a bludgeon and a weapon. But the real question is, uh, Glenn, you know, how can we speak critically about affirmative action if we don't, if we're not allowed to talk about the facts. Now, you could say, well, you can't ever talk about your own experience, even over 20 years, because I've taught this class for 20 years, and I have a whole file drawer full of grades, which I look at and scrutinize every year. You, we, you need to deal with much bigger databases, but the problem is those aren't being disclosed either. Richard Sander, who's tried to do studies on Mitch mismatch, he has had the darndest time getting any data out of the powers that be, the American Association of Law Schools, different law schools. Uh, they've wised up that if they keep all this stuff secret, then no one has um, the, the empirics to critique 
affirmative action. So I think the subtext here, and it's relevant to what we're going to talk about today, is that affirmative action really is off limits for criticism. They, they want to set it up so that uh, criticizing affirmative action becomes verboten in effect. You don't have the tools and the instruments to do it. And more than that, anybody who does it is a racist and a bad person, and it's not consistent with our values and the values of our institution and all of that sort of thing. So you can shut it down. I think, you know, what happened with me with immigration and talking about the prowess of Western culture, and there's a whole oh, cluster. Hold on a minute, Amy. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I don't want to. I don't want to uh, lose the thread of this uh, a conversation about relative performance by race and mm-hmm. and affirmative action in that previous controversy. I very much want to talk about the immigration issue, but I think just just a point that's dangling here, uh, which has to do with uh, here's how I would uh, put it: You have meritocracy first, okay? So you've got ranking. Penn is uh, not admitting everybody. It's a selective law school. It's hard to get into. It's supposed to be hard to get into. Kids compete to get to an Ivy League law school. I mean, that's meritocracy. There's a layer cake, and there's smaller layers at the top than at the bottom. People are competing, okay? There's status involved in the competition. There's honor. At stake here is not just resource allocation, but also the creation and the distribution of honor, of recognition. You've got race, you've got racial differences, you've got racial differences in preparation and performance. Uh, somebody out there is going to say you've got racial differences in competency and in uh, endowment, okay? But, of course, we can't go there. Like I said, there should be rules. I don't know exactly what they should be about how we talk about these, but you've got racial differences. That's what affirmative action is uh, uh, meant to counter. Affirmative action then comes in because you need representation into the hierarchical competitive environment. So now issues of honor, status, dignity, reputation, okay, become centrally important. And there's conflicts. There there have to be conflicts. I I mean, it's very straightforward logically. Among all the people of the same race, how do you decide who gets in? You don't just admit them at random. You select among them by the very same criteria that will if acknowledge, underscore the difference on average between the racial groups. That's something that we can't quite countenance. So, uh, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a deep corruption here is the word that I'm going to use. And I don't mean to <laughs> sound like some kind of uh, anti-affirmative action ideologue. I'm just trying to be realistic about what are the, uh, what are the stakes. There's a deep corruption here. Um, African-Americans have to somehow establish by our actual performance the counter narrative to the narrative that we're not up to snuff. We got to somehow face up to and establish that by our actual performance. Any compromise on that is self-defeating. If, if you lower the bar and then try to play a game like pretend hide and seek, I don't see, you just leave the status quo ante, uh, a differential distribution of honor undisturbed. <laughs> you, you, you don't get equality. You, you don't get any kind of justice in that. There's something very profoundly corrupt in that. Anyway, thank you for my, allowing that soliloquy. Well, no, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you, I guess. I mean, but I guess the question would be, does it really uh, help to once you've made the decision to do that? And that is what we're doing, Glenn. I mean, even that would be denied. You know, no, no one would speak as frankly as you do about the fact that we do have a double standard. It's not at the very top echelons, you know, a, a super severe double standard, but it, it is a measurable double standard uh, to talk about the consequences of it. You know, does, how does that play out? Um, do we have, uh, does, does affirmative action do what seems to be promised, which is have people catch up instantly so that when they come out the other end, it's all made good? You know, and in my experience, that that's not what happens. And it, it carries, you know, who gives a damn about law school? It carries on beyond law school uh, into law firms, into jobs, into positions. Law partners will not talk about their experience in law firms. It is deeply verboten to do that. But when they've wow. had a few drinks behind closed doors... Wow. 
You no. see, I don't know whether what you're saying is true or false. I'm not in saying that, trying to say that what you're saying is false. I, I simply don't know. I don't have those facts. If true, how horrible. Okay. So plausible, it could certainly be true. <laughs> what, what am I talking about that could be true? That on the average, um, the uh, junior lawyers at uh, a white shoe selective firms who are black and who have come out of good law schools but abetted by affirmative action are not performing as well and everybody knows it. That's the thing that you just said well, that I'm saying, I don't know if it's, well, didn't you? I don't know if it's true or not. And I said, if true, how horrible, how, how horrible. And it might be true. It, I mean, it wouldn't be true of everybody. You know, it's a problem of overplacement because we produce good. I am not saying that our lawyers from whatever background are not good lawyers. They're all, you know, well qualified. It, it's just that when you take someone who wouldn't otherwise be hired in setting X, were they not a minority, and you place them in that setting instead of another one where on a race blind basis they would be hired, which is really what you're talking about here, uh, problems can result. They won't always result, but problems can result. That's all I'm saying. And, you know, can I prove it? Well, one of the problems is I can't prove it because well, people are so secretive about it. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, that's a deep point. I mean, I, and that's been kind of the central theme here. How do you know what's true? Right. When, nope. when your ability to get command of and to discuss the facts is colored by all of these uh, status things that are going on, all these. I mean, you know, at, at the at the root, at the root of it all is somehow... If African-American underperformance, let's take another arena, incarceration. So, you know, there are more blacks in prison. Uh, and these encounters with the police, the kind of thing that Heather McDonald writes about and so forth. Uh, there's, you know, there, there are these incidents. There's this whole kind of cultural uh, uh, world of, of uh, conflict and, and discourse and whatnot around race, inequality, power, domination. And the, the policing is one of it. So, so um <laughs> The, the the subtext of all of the discussion is black inferiority. Oh, no, Glenn. I think that's a really loaded term that just leads us in the wrong direction. Let, let me just make my point, Amy. Uh, hold on. I okay. We, okay. You, you I duly noted that you objected to the term, but I'm, I'm, I'm not... I'm not saying what you may think that I'm saying. I'm not calling somebody a racist for saying that black people are inferior. Well, I don't in like fact, in fact the subtext applies to black people as well. It, it applies to black people who have to somehow rationalize and process the objective fact of disparity. That's why I want to look at a different arena from selective uh, higher education and professional education and look at incarceration, because I think some of the same issues are at play. I think there's a kind of affirmative action spirit in the discourse about incarceration. The notion that mass incarceration presumptively, presumptively provides evidence of racial domination. When in fact, it, as I'm sure you would agree, uh, at least also provides evidence of the behavioral disparities by race, which occasion people to have been incarcerated in the first place. And that, and that subtext uh, uh, flirts with all of these things. They'll call it trope. Whenever I hear somebody use the word trope in reference to some social observation, I know what they're doing. They're trying to, they're trying to censor the discourse by uh, you know, ruling out of bounds the idea that you could even frame the uh, uh, question. That, you know, if I say 70% of black kids are born to women who aren't married, it has now become a trope. It has become a thing that by virtue of having said it, you reveal yourself to be the kind of person who could never be interested in racial justice. And, and this is a kind of willful blindness. It's a kind of limitation of, of social vision and social analysis in the service of a phony normative framework because it's a... It's not equality. This is what I'm getting to. I'm sorry, people, if I beat a, a drum here, but the goal should be equality. This is not equality, okay? We all know that the jails being full of black people is a reflection, in part, some behaviors, in part. Observing that is not to make a racist statement. It can't be. If you allow, if you require that one not attend to that fact, you're, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's like, you know, I don't know. I'm flabbergasted. It's willful stupidity. So, but but I, these are the states. These are the states. No, I can I sort of pull out a theme here, which yes. is a theme that I see accelerating in our society, 
uh, especially on the left, and I think it's partly a manifestation of the kind of panic that the Democrats and their, their handmaidens, including the university, the media, are in, which is that they've boxed themselves into a corner on certain extreme positions, and they think the way to deal with it is to suppress, to, to spend all their time hunting down heretics and then punish those heretics and in various ways silence those heretics by getting them to not say certain things, to not notice certain things, to not, uh, to not observe uh, certain phenomena. And if we can just get them to shut up, uh, then they will think like us. So I see this as a, 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 a general trend across domains that is happening. But can I just say one thing about this word inferior, which is a very loaded word, and I'll tell you why I don't like it. Okay. Because there are different realms, I think, in which black people still uh, lag behind. That's how I would put it. Um, so take educational achievement. You know, Charles Murray in chapter 22 of The Bell Curve, which is an excellent chapter, and I would urge you to reread it, he (laughs) says, the fact that you don't do well on tests says nothing about your moral worth. It it really is, is a category mistake to think that we are judging you as, you know, a better or worse person because, you know, your SAT score isn't so great and isn't as good as it should be, right? But then now we get into criminality, okay? So, yeah, criminality not now starts to be about behavior and, w- and whether that behavior is laudable or less laudable. So, But we're making a kind of local judgment about uh, your behavior, and we have to make that judgment. But it's not a global judgment about, you know, that, that is pertinent to everything about you and certainly not about your inherent worth. So that word inferior has a kind of global feel, a feel of global judgment that I think is terribly misleading when we ought to be looking at specific behaviors and asking ourselves, you know, how how can those behaviors be improved? Now, of course, you know, People on the left, like Tanahazy Coates, whose name I always mispronounce. Tanahazy. Tanahazy. They have a theory uh, that everything is due to structures of oppression. We're all puppets on a string. Blacks can't help themselves. They can't help themselves but not get married. They can't help themselves but, you know, commit crimes when they commit them. They can't help themselves by not do better at not doing better educationally it's all kind of foreordained by this nefarious horrific white supremacist racist society well you know that's that's a theory it's a theory i think is ultimately incoherent doesn't fit the facts and is counterproductive i think we kind of agree on that right um but the alternative to that theory is not Blacks are inferior. It's really something much more nuanced, which is in many ways the opposite. Blacks are people. They are moral agents. They are people like everybody else. And as such, they, although circumstances matter, they need to step up and take a hold of their own lives and take responsibility for their own lives. That, I think, is the very opposite of regarding somebody as inferior. Uh, yeah, you know, let me comment, Amy. Uh, you raised a number of issues that I think are uh, worthy of further comment. Charles Murray, I have a list here. I just want to make sure that each topic gets mentioned. Uh, the issue of inferiority, uh, the difference between crime and academics is venues in which you're making these uh, judgments, and uh, the importance of agency. So let me see if I can touch on those briefly. So, you know, uh, Charles Murray is a pariah. You know that, don't you? He's the kind of guy you throw a pie in his face if he comes to your campus. He's a, a racist. He's a white supremacist. No, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Yeah. This has been established. We all know this, okay? So, therefore, chapter 22, which is an excellent chapter, your reference to Charles Murray and his point, which I have my own uh, views about. I'm not sure I agree with you entirely that, uh, look, I'm not saying you're a bad person just because I'm saying that you are dull, quote, unquote. Those are the words used in the bell curve, you know, in terms of where you fit in the distribution of IQ. Uh, and it's true. Of course, it's true. There's no necessary moral judgment in that. There's not. I, I agree with that. I actually had a, a discussion with John McWhorter recently in which he's trying to say Trump is dumb. And I'm asking him, why do you need to say he's dumb? 
What you really mean to say is that he's bad. You think that by calling him dumb, you're calling him bad. I think there's a fair amount of evidence that he's not dumb. He's many things. But, you know, but, but it was like, you know, what is bad and what is, you know, okay, so I take, I take that point. On the other hand, on the other hand, given the context of race in the history of Western culture, okay, I, I'm talking about colonial domination. I'm talking about enslavement. So I'm not going to bore you with a whole lot of chatter. Uh, Michael Eric Dyson-esque. I'm not going to do that, okay? I'm just, you know what I'm referring to, but given that, given that, no. And the issue of justification for the practice of the domination, okay? Now, European culture and civilization, I don't know, 16th century, 17th century, 18th century. So they spread out throughout the world and they dominate, and this is a massive global uh, phenomenon, okay? And it raises all these profound questions. Centuries later, we're still struggling with these questions. And in that context, in that context, the inferiority of the African, the subhumanity of the African, the stigma attendant there too. That's why there are taboos. That's why I say, I come back, there need to be rules about what we can talk about and what we can't. I don't know what they should be, I'm, but I'm fairly confident that there, there should be somehow rules. I don't think the system as we have it now is very good at all. And I profoundly agree with you on this point about agency. I mean, um, uh, I I just think it's an intellectual uh, disaster, disaster that uh, so many of our people, I speak of African-Americans, but I could be speaking of progressives and so forth, uh, imbue this uh, uh, notion of black victimization with so much power that, that they say things are beyond our control. The idea that some of these pathologies and we could go into, you know, but come on now, the murder rate in some of these cities and what's going on in these neighborhoods and all I can think about is the grief and the pain and, and, and the pathos. And it's unbelievable. It doesn't get sufficiently reported. OK, there should be, you know, <laughs> we should know much more the granular detail. There should be long pieces in The New Yorker that follows around one of these families that has lost two sons to some of the, you know, et cetera. We should know what gang culture looks like from ethnographic studies of people who have gone inside without feeling that they have to be in the service of a political agenda uh, in order to, but in any case, all I'm trying to say is um, uh, I, I, the, the idea that we have no control over that, right. that, that that is simply the consequence of, you know, as you say, structural racism. It's a profoundly uh, infantilizing uh, uh, idea. And, and you're right. The person who insists on agency recognizes your humanity. The, the one who, who agrees with you that you're the permanent victim about whom we can only have discussions of what we're going to do, but who can do nothing for themselves. They're the ones who don't see your humanity, who don't take you seriously, for whom you are never going to be an equal. You're always going to be a client, a ward. Uh, it's horrible. It's, uh, it's just, it's absolutely horrible. Right. And so that's why I, I don't like the word inferior, because I think that in many ways, the people who reject the victim narrative are seeing are really seeing blacks as equals and they're willing to judge them. I often joke with my students that, you know, in our current grievance culture, our victimology uh, firmament, the only full adults, the only responsible people are white males, you know, that's the good news. They are full moral agents. The bad news is they're responsible for everything bad. Uh, so these are two flip sides of the same coin, right? The only grown-ups in the room are white males. And I see it in the feminist side, too. I mean, The irony is profound because these are the people to whom these appeals are being made. You well, know, right. <laughs> so you're presuming upon the decency, ultimately, uh, the intellectual uh, fluidity to be able to hear your argument and be persuaded by it uh, and to, because you want reform. You want reform. And yet, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting problem, it seems to me. Yeah. Uh, but listen, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the latest. Uh, and I need you to set it up because I'm not sure I know all the facts. There was a National Conservative Conference in Washington, D.C. There was a session to which you contributed a paper and made a presentation on immigration. And uh, there was then a huge brouhaha because you are said to have been a racist for asserting that some cultures should be preferred to others, European or Northern European cultures would be preferred to others in uh, immigration prioritizing. Did I get that right? Well, I didn't say that precisely. I said that cultural 
um, affinity, cultural similarity with, you know, Western culture, post-Enlightenment Western culture, which I think is is fairly well defined, um, should be given some weight for the reason that it makes assimilation a whole lot easier, but not just assimilation. We have to face the question of how do we preserve, protect, defend, and continue um, our high level of functioning as a first world country. Uh, and uh, we, we do have to be concerned about bringing in large, this is really a, a, a thesis about mass immigration, mass migration, bringing in people uh, who are at some distance from us in many respects, uh, you know, we'll, how long will it take for them to get up to speed to be able to really help run our country at the level of that we expect and that, you know, we, um, to the standard that we, we are used to. Um, and so cultural distance is something that conservatives should think about, and especially since conservatives, as some people on the left, believe that culture is uh, ineffable, profound, has many uh, facets and many dimensions. We don't completely, we're not completely able to control it. It's really not clear how people shift from one cultural outlook or set of assumptions and practices and behaviors to another. I mean, there's a lot that we don't understand about the transmission of culture. So it's really a council of caution. Now, what got me into trouble? Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Yeah. That's the thesis. And then we're going to talk about what got, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to summarize because there's a lot of information and people care. You know, okay, so Western culture. Okay, right. so f- promoting assimilation. Okay, so first world country. Okay, so that's a comparative statement about cultures across different uh, geographic regions in the on the planet. And so the implications of mass migration. So what is Western culture again? Well, I mean, I can I can give you a list here if you have a little bit of time. Brief, no, brief. briefly. No, I just want a, a synopsis of what you mean when you well, reference I mean, Western culture compared to what? Okay, so it's. First of all, it's the institutions, achievements, commitments, and practices of the West, so this small little area of the globe, which is mainly Europe, mainly Northern Europe, the Anglosphere, uh, and it's what they developed. But, but what are you talking about? Are you talking about monogamy? Are you talking about primogenitor? Well, if you give me a, you... a chance, I'll give you some of the elements here, all right? So a Enlightenment rights-based, law-respecting, technologically advanced, meritocratic, evidence and reason-based, accountable, honest, intellectually scrupulous, transparent, self-critical, liberal democratic capitalism. That's what we have in common as the West, right? And we can get into more details. Okay, I just want to stop because let's proceed one step at a time. So, So what I heard there was a list of institutions. Yes. Norms. Yes. Uh, practices. Uh, and and uh, uh, so on. Assumptions. You know, I mean, the idea, of, for example, of rule of law. You said enlightenment. Okay, so who? What? What is the self? Uh, what are the legitimate foundations for the exercise of government power? Uh, what is private property, and how should we be thinking about? It? I mean, these are all. Now, are there right answers? I'm really serious here. Well, you're there, going let, let me, no, I'm no, no, no. So, contrast it. Contrast it to another part of the world where ideas about the person in the self and the autonomy of the self, ideas about uh, property and, and collective ownership or private property, whatnot, are different. Now, okay, I want to know, know how I know one of them is better than the other. Because people walk with their feet, okay? I mean, you know, how do we know one of them is better than the other? Well, the way we know is just by looking at what life is like for people and who has the nice things, who has the peace, the stability, uh, the dignity, the prosperity, the science, the technology, the advances, um, the, the great institutions. I mean, you know, the first thing I would contest, and I know that this is, is taboo in the current era, and that's part of what I find so preposterous, I really... I am going to reject the notion that, quote-unquote, all cultures are equal. 
I think that the West has pulled ahead across many domains in ways that are objectively desirable. Now, okay, and, no, so, so hold on, hold on. I, I gave you a moment, and I just want to—I want to put something else on the table for you to think about. All right, so I'm worried now about circularity, okay? Because what I just heard you say was, uh, first of all, we have established that when we're talking about our institutions as well as norms and uh, practices and so on that characterize different ways of dealing with different kinds of problems like political problems, the relation of the individual to the state, like economic type issues, like issues of, like you say, uh, you know, transparency and things like that. Okay, so there are, these things are different. Secondly, you have said we know one's better than the other because the outcomes are better. I think that's what I heard you say. I don't mean to misrepresent you. And I'm worried about circularity because it doesn't follow from the fact that the outcomes are better, that the outcomes are better because of this, although I'm prepared to concede to you uh, the thesis of, you know, and we can look in, uh, you know, the literature and political science and economics of comparative uh, developmental study and whatnot, private property, economic uh, capitalism, open markets, uh, a relatively, you know, how do, uh, uh, in uh, Why Nations Fail, uh, you know, the book that I'm talking about, uh, Asamaglu and uh, Robinson, uh, right. This beautiful book. And Lawrence Harrison uh, and Sam. I mean, there are a bunch know, of people who... So, so you about. can look, you know, between North Korea and South Korea, you can look across the border at the southwest of the United States or whatever, and you can see cheek by jowl, you know, very different worlds that exist because they are underneath very different institutional foundations. And some are more effective than others. And uh, so we, we, we don't want to uh, uh, water down, if I hear you correctly, you say, uh, uh, what's the word, run our country? I mean, how are we going to, you know, stay productive and effective if these people from these regions which have these cultural habits uh, come into us? Now, I'm, I'm worried about a kind of circularity because it, uh, uh, are they carrying a virus? Well, no, they're not carrying a virus, Glenn. Well, I, I think tra- there's what is your possible- theory of cultural transmission? What's your theory of cultural well, transmission? Well, but that's the problem, okay? So there's two possibilities, one is what I termed in my talk magic dirt, which is this, you know, it's an ideology, really. It's a, an assumption that when chunks of people come from one place to another, they immediately give up all of the commitments, the ideas, the mindset that, you know, they had there and they adopt what we have here. Uh, and it just happens like a chameleon, right? So that's one extreme. The other is, ooh, uh, now, do they really, and how long does it take? But let me, let me say something else, and, and let me speak here. Let's All right, Amy, back, the let's floor is yours. The step. floor is yours. Yep. Let's go back one step and, and ask the following question. And I actually just did a podcast with The Spectator, and we talked about this quite a bit. So why is the third world so, you know, stagnant, so poor, so backwards, so, la- you know, why, why can't they keep the lights on? Why don't they have good medical care? Why don't they have a good sanitation system? I mean, we have, the, we wrote the book on all this stuff, a transparent, benign government, low corruption, uh, accountability, um, you know, evidence-based empirical uh, administration, uh, a great science establishment. I mean, why are all these things lacking, especially since the West has created over thousand, a thousand years all this stuff, you know? Well, not single-handedly, Amy. Come what on, let's not, go, let's, not get, let's not get chauvinistic. No, I mean, I'm, are you I'm saying not they chauvinistic. Had, I'm just you, asking. Come on, I'm saying the West single-handedly, come on. Uh, most of, I'm sorry. It's a global like, civilization. What uh, we count as modernity was developed uh, in a fairly small number of places and advanced in the very small number of places. And you're not allowed to say that, but I mean, I think the historical... No, 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 it's not. It's a question of what one means by, when, by what, what one's saying. Here, here, okay, you wanted to speak. I don't want to interrupt you. I was well, giving yeah, you I ample mean, time to make your point. Yeah, but sure. but I, have, I have, you know, I mean... What is stopping, what is preventing, um, you know, Honduras from being just like, you know, New England? I mean, what... Why is is Zimbabwe not Denmark? Uh, And frankly, you know, we have these really implausible theories like it's colonialism. Well, I just find that to be a total non-starter. Now, having said that, 
Okay, having... It doesn't follow from that, <laughs> that I should not allow Zimbabweans to come into New York City. Okay, it, well, that is... A that's the question. Step. I agree that's with the you. Let, 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 me say something. let me say something very brief. Okay, very, very briefly. Or I, I privilege, because I'm the moderator. Okay, Here's what I want to say. I, I'm I an economist. I'm an economist. Here's a very simple theory. There are two equilibria. The good equilibria and their bad equilibria. In the good equilibrium, you can trust your neighbor. Because you can trust your neighbor, transactions are possible. You don't have to attend so closely to your property. You don't have to worry about your neighbor cheating you when you all could agree on something that would be mutually productive. That allows you to prosper, okay? Because you can trust your neighbor. Neighbors trust each other because they believe the other neighbor is going to be trustworthy. Trust ends up being a norm that's an equilibrium in the repeated game model of this little social interaction. There's another equilibrium. No neighbor is trustworthy, and therefore no neighbor is to be trusted. That equilibrium has very little collaboration and little joint product that can allow for growth. They're impoverished, they're angry and they're mean, and they're lonely and solitary. That's another equilibrium. Here's my point. The fact that those two equilibria exist in two different geographical locations does not imply that the individuals who happen to be situated in those equilibria carry something with them which, if imported from the bad equilibrium to the good equilibrium, would ruin the good equilibrium. It would still be a trustworthy society. The person who couldn't trust their neighbor in Zimbabwe will learn to trust their neighbor in New York City. I don't know if that's true, but it could be true. Well, you're and, and if it is true, I'm not let saying- me finish. Amy, if it's true, it vitiates the logic of your argument. I know, but Glenn, you're saying it could be true. Yes, it's not necessary. I mean, we, how do we know, you know, whether it will actually play out that way? I mean, contagion can be negative or positive. You know, there's a parallel to this in the schools debate, the sort of, you know, income integration debate. Oh, if we just move poor kids to nice schools with middle-class kids, there will be uplift and they will behave just like the middle-class kids. But, you know, there's the possibility, and a lot of parents worry about this, and you can call them every name in the book, but it's not irrational for them to worry about it. Maybe my kids will start acting like those kids if there are enough of them, if there are enough of them, and, you know, they, they carry their habits of mind and their behaviors and their outlook with them, uh, we don't know whether contagion is negative or positive. So one of the corollaries here, Glenn, is, well, first of all, we don't know. Okay? We we really don't know the answer. I, I the can second see that. Is, we don't know. Yeah. The second is numbers matter, right? So mass migration is a very different phenomenon from a small number of people from a culture that in many respects is very distant from yours and you bring that small number of people in, and maybe they're selected in a certain way as well. So I'll give you Muslims in the United States who are here. There aren't very many of them here right now, frankly, overall. And they're, they're doing pretty well. They assimilate pretty well. They get it. They become, quote, unquote, Americanized, whatever that means, and they're very uh, loyal citizens. <laughs> and the question is, you know, if we brought in, like, many, many, many of them, would still that still be the case and how that's an open question i think that's an open question i think europe is grappling with this today all right so we need to be realistic about the fact that with all the money we've poured into studying the human condition and all the chattering academics we have blah blah blahing all over the country they really don't have a clue about why the third world is caught in their equilibrium and why we have pulled out of it and how it all works together. It's just one big kind of mystery. So for them to say, well, we know that magic dirt will work and it will work immediately and everything will be fine and our systems will all hum along in their you know, wonderful way, no matter who we bring in, how many and from where. Let me give you an example. I, I want to give a concrete example. Okay, and then, I, and then I want you to talk about the post-comment controversy. Okay, all right. So, you know, and I just read an article about the Malaysian Airlines flight that fell into the Indian Ocean. It was an Atlantic Monthly. It was very good. It was riveting. The Malaysian NTSB, you know, the agency charged with investigating it, they wrote a sham report 
it was all performance art. They didn't really look at the facts. They hid facts. They did a lousy job. It was like a show trial. They, it, was, it was useless. The author said, well, here's the thing. In Malaysia, the truth isn't welcome. Well, Glenn, that sentence speaks volumes, okay? The but, truth isn't welcome. Well, you know, in our culture, although we sometimes lapse, we don't have investigations that are up to snuff, we know what the standard is, right? We are committed to that standard. And it has taken us hundreds and hundreds of years to become scrupulously, rigorously, empirically oriented to charge people in at the top with getting at the truth. This is the hallmark of the West, however much we lapse. Okay, from it. I, I think we trust progress. the NTSB in Malaysia to come and investigate. No, I, I wouldn't. Uh, and, and allow style. me to comment. Allow me to comment. I, I because I think this is very productive. It's productive for me anyway. Because I abs- I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, on this particular question, and there are a lot of other examples that I suppose we could give. I'm not sure I want to lay down on an operating theater table in Indonesia either. I'm not sure that I would want to rely on the university to educate my child in Indonesia either. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things. I mean, these are cultural differences. I, 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 they are. They are cultural differences. They, they are, uh, and and they are uh, significant, and they can be at least empirically in terms of some kind of statistical regularity, differentiated as between, quote, the West and, quote, the third world. These are your terms, and I'm, I'm not going to get at you about terms, although there are people who would. Uh, but, but there, of course, of course, uh, if I were to get off of it, you know, I mean, I, don't I think about that when I get on an airplane? I, I mean, I, I'm relying on Good. these systems, these invisible systems of security. I know diddly about radar, air traffic control, regulating traffic flow. I don't, even, I don't know anything about the maintenance schedule of the airline, the extent to which I can rely upon manufacturers of products to actually uh, not have faulty things and so on and so on. I'm assuming all of this stuff is going to be okay. When I get on an airplane in Los Angeles, I'm not so worried about it. If I got on an airplane in Nairobi, I might be worried about it. I mean, okay. Now, what are you going to do with me? What are you going to do with me now? This kind of thing. So I, I'm accepting that. You're a racist. Uh, I'm, I, well, there are complicated historical reasons for the differences in this thing. I was just going to call to your attention, and no, colonialism is some kind of blanket thing that does not, does not satisfy me at all intellectually. But I was going to call to your attention the fact that under Soviet domination, throughout uh, Eastern Europe, I'm going to have to step away for a moment and get my power cord. Uh, throughout Eastern Europe and uh, East Central Europe, uh, the the uh, institutions of uh, you know governance and uh, legal uh, regime and whatnot were corrupt in ways that you are describing about the third world. Not the same, not the same, but there were many things that were very, very similar. Um, and that, in the fall of uh, since post nineteen eighty nine and whatnot, has given us a new dispensation throughout this region, and one could study it carefully. Uh, I'm sure if I were a person who might be taking my money and trying to buy a company in, uh, you know, Budapest, I might have to worry about what the Hungarian structure is in 2019 relative to what it was in 1979. And I would certainly not want to put my money on the table in the 1979 world. And I think a lot of people would feel uh, the same way about it. So, so you know, it's a, uh, the Hungarians are a part of European civilization. You get my drift. Yes. They're, they're, they're a part of that same inheritance uh, from the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and whatnot. So, so There's a spectrum. I mean, it's, essentialize. It's, I'm saying don't essentialize. Okay, so I'm that was my statement. Let me, let me get my PowerPoint. I'll be right back. I'm, I'm not essentializing. I honestly and truly do think that words like essentializing are not helpful. Okay, they are not helpful because they don't get at, you know, the, the functional significance of what I'm trying to say which is, of course, there's a spectrum. Of course, you know, there are liminal nations that are, you know, they, they do talk about the first world and the third world. That means there's a second world. Uh, so there are these <laughs> nations that have tried to pull out into the sunny uplands of, of Western 
you know, achievement and culture to join the West, and they have, for various reasons, struggled and faltered. I mean, Iran is a good example. Turkey is a good example. Argentina, uh, where they had leaders who said, well, now it's time to modernize. And then there's, and, and it for, for whatever reason, for many different reasons, they stalled out or they even sunk back. But there are elements of, of the countries and the cultures that are more advanced. I mean, Turkey is in many ways a very nice country. Japan, you see, is a wonder because Japan managed to take what was best about the West, make it work, right, uh, improve across many different sectors, scientific, governmental, economic, capitalistic, financial, um, and educational, and and yet retain elements of their wonderful original culture, and they've they've made it work. And actually, um, uh, Sam Huntington, uh, in his book about um, culture and who are we, says the Japanese they're unique. Okay, but for everyone else, it's it's been a struggle. Now. You know, I am. I will not cede the position that uh, Western culture is. I, I hate. You know, the word superior gets me in trouble. I don't know why. I would say that they have peerless prowess across domains. That is how I would put it. Okay. Uh, they have developed peerless prowess across domains, um, and they just have. Uh, I want to kind of move along a little bit, okay? I'm div- I want to divide this. So we've been talking about essentialism. This is the way I'm thinking about it so far. You've been making a difference, uh, uh, argument about the difference of cultural f- effectiveness across uh, the West and other. And I've been saying, don't think it's intrinsic to the peoples. Uh, think of it somehow as a equilibrium phenomenon that could vary even among people uh, of the same uh, stock, uh, that's an essentialism point, but there's also, I think there's a chauvinism point. I'm sure you are going to get this criticism. Mm-hmm. Uh, not just that you're an essentialist, uh, somehow essentializing Western culture, reifying something, but also that you're a chauvinist, that you're going to take pride, that you're tooting the horn, that you're, you know, you're celebratory. Uh, well, you I might do even, take pride. Might, you might even have a nationalistic streak in you. You might even be patriotic. <laughs> And, and I wanted to make the point, Amy, that a, another one of the reasons why you're a pariah, and I do want to understand, we have limited time, something of the repercussions, uh, is that, is that uh, th- there is an anti-chauvinistic uh, element, just like there's an anti-essentialist element. People who want to trash the West, okay? Right. Whose narrative is that Columbus was a nightmare, I think this is actually a really important point. I'm sorry uh, that the expansion of Europe through world domination in the, from the 15th century through the 18th, 19th century was a, somehow a quote unquote disaster for humanity, close quote, uh, that the moral weight of slavery, of the extermination of the native populations, of the conquest of lands uh, and so forth, that there's something profoundly morally wrong about that. All right. Now, there's a, the, the, the counter note, the chauvinistic note, the celebratory note, the Columbus Day should stay and not be uh, Native American Day uh, note, is to say, that's progress. That's modernity. That's civilization. Uh, what, what do we think the world would look like if indeed Europe hadn't expanded and dominated through uh, those centuries? Do you really want to live without modern dentistry? <laughs> yeah, well, can, can I just address this? Without air no, I, 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 I know <laughs> there's a hypocrisy here. I, I, I just well, it, well you know, did I make my point? I'm, I'm not sure because I didn't accuse you of anything. I, what I was saying was there is the separate realm of discourse aside from the essentialism discourse, which is about how much pride to take or how much sense of shame and regret to feel about European domination of the world, which is... Glenn, I, I am, I am so world. utterly familiar with this, and here's what I would say about it, okay? okay. This kind of running down of the West, and I don't know if you've read Sukato Mehta's book, This Land is Our Land, I call it Vengeance Multiculturalism, right? That the, I, the third read. world people should wreak revenge on the West for all of the horrible things that were done to them. I'm not sitting I'm not here apologizing... For imperialism or colonialism, I'm not apologizing for them, really? although I do have something to say about it, which is if the tables were turned, 
I honestly don't think we would have been treated any better. I mean, if you read about how the Indian tribes treated each other, if you've ever read Francis Parkman's accounts of, you know, the Indian tribes, it's not pretty, okay? The, the romanticization of, of these indigenous peoples is ridiculous, all right? It's grotesque. So, so let's just put that aside. There's a lot of, of fault to go around here. I, I agree that the West has done some awful things, but to focus exclusively on that to the exclusion of everything else is just a distortion. And I think it's a destructive distortion because, you know, we have brought good things to life. Uh, frankly, the West invented modernity. So to have people angrily typing on computers, you know, running off to the dentist, um, taking advantage of all of these venisons that the West has generated and running them down as irredeemably evil, I think is disingenuous. Take obstetrics. I want to talk about obstetrics for a minute. Okay, things we take for granted. We don't even think about them. We are so ungrateful, Glenn. Right? I mean, women were dying like flies for thousands and thousands of years in childbirth. Child mortality was 50% until, you know, well into the 1800s, or at least the 1700s. Okay. I can't believe that. Did you say 50%, 50 percent, five zero? 50. I mean, 50 percent. You said there's an even head. chance that the, the child will die? Yes, yes. I mean, half, close to half of babies. Would, well, okay, don't No, no, I'm not saying I don't believe you. I'm just saying yeah. it's an amazing number. So all of a sudden comes along, and women were in charge of this stuff for thousands of years, and we were flatlined. I mean, we made no progress whatsoever. All of a sudden, you know, yeah. a handful of white guys comes along. That's what they were, right? Joseph Lister, Ignat Semmelweis, John Snow, uh, you know, Virchow, I, people who figured out obstetrics, uh, public health, uh, invented modern medicine, really. And all of a sudden, the death rate plummeted for new mothers. The child mortality rate plummeted. Hundreds of millions of people were alive because of the efforts, the ingenuity, and the devotion of these small number of men. And we just, to hell with them. You know, the question, the question, Amy, is in light of that, what I mean, do we do okay, with that? that's a historical observation about the evolution of technology in a certain very important aspect of area of human endeavor, uh, medicine. And it is tied to the West, but based on history and also based on the logic of the development of the various sub disciplines that contributed to this advancement. I mean, the technology, the science, uh, it was happening in the West. So the question, it seems to me, is that fact, given that fact. And we're saying that the, the cultures that we're talking about are these uh, institutions and these norms and these habituated social uh, practices and uh, arrangements and so on that facilitate human progress, growth of knowledge, the advancement of technology, uh, uh, the ex you know, extension of life and quality of life and happiness. So the question is, though, what's the relevance of the differences, this historical difference to contemporary immigration policy? Now, I, I understand, and I want to try to conclude this so we can talk just a bit about the aftermath, you to be saying that um, if the numbers are small, maybe we can entertain the idea that it's kind of an accident of uh, history or whatever, and we don't, we don't really think our ways of life are threatened by admitting people who may happen to be coming from places that are not uh, reflective of those ins institutions. But if the numbers are large, we have to we have to really worry. We have to really be concerned. And I must say, if indeed that's what you're saying, it's at least a plausible thing to be, uh, you know, to be entertained. It's a it's it's a possibility. OK, but, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right to say, well, once we recognize, you know, that Western ways, Western values, Western systems are worth preserving, protecting and defending, that there's something there that we should be concerned to maintain and continue, which many people would, you know, call you a uh, racist right out right yeah, there. They would. Okay, which I think is is whacked, if you want to know my honest opinion. 
I, I think it's just, you know, the, the more counterfactual and, and overwhelmingly preposterous something is, the more social, uh, you know, the more force has to be exerted to, to suppress it. And that's, I think, what the left is doing. They're just punishing people who say anything good about Western society. I mean, my dean, you know, you can't praise the West. That makes you a white supremacist. I mean, it's nuts. I, I think that's nuts. Okay, now people talk about... But having said that, what is the implication for immigration? And you're okay, absolutely you right. That. that is a... Doesn't follow, right, that we need to be worried at all about bringing anybody in from anywhere if you believe in magic dirt, if you believe that our our culture is so powerful and, you know, so firmly uh, entrenched that anybody who comes in will just say that, you know, we're Come leaving. On, that, that, that's pejorative. Magic dirt. I mean, no, no. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have to believe that. All I have to believe is that people's individual behaviors adapt to the context in which they're embedded, such that observing that they come from a context in which the general behavior is bad doesn't imply that in our context they're going to behave badly. That's not believing in magic dirt. Well, I mean, magic dirt is just a, a, a clever little expression to summarize just what you said. I mean, it's no different from just what you said, okay? But it, it takes less time to say it. Uh, but, you know, there... <laughs> okay, they want, they want your head on a platter. I want to hear about that. I heard discussions. Somebody said there are trustees who would talk at Penn talking about, isn't there any way we can get rid of her to yes, help with the yes. First Amendment? I mean, what's up with that? To hell with free speech, they say. To hell with the First Amendment. To hell with tenure. To hell with it all. This is the most important thing. Well, I mean, this is this attitude now. I think it has to do with this panic and this hysteria that's coming out of the corner that the, you know, the crazy Democrats have boxed themselves into. And, of course, the university is just an extension of that wing of the Democratic Party of progressivism. And, of course, the media is also a handmaiden of this. So we have a kind of three-way panic, right? Uh, we can't have these quizlings, these traitors lurking within an institution that we control, expressing these ideas. So something has to be done about her. And we're all mesmerized by, well, there's really two mistakes. One is to make a fetish of diversity, inclusion, and equity, which has become the end-all, be-all of everything. Well, you're, you're in the university, right? And it's, it's metastasized into all areas. It's like a bucket of paint that's been you know, tipped over, and the paint just goes everywhere. So any thought that's inconsistent with what we claim to be the priorities of diversity, inclusion, and equity has to be banished. And the second is, what is a university doing taking a stand on immigration, which is a vexed, controversial issue of politics and policy? Frankly, according to the Chicago principles, it's none of their business. You know, they can have their own little diversity and inclusion thing going. And immigration has nothing to do with it. The Chicago principles say wisely, universities should take as few positions on matters of public controversy as is possible, consistent with just running the railroad, right? They have no business opining in this moralistic way about, you know, what positions on immigration are repugnant? What positions well, are... Let, let, me, let me just make an observation. I, 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 I like this uh, very much because um, when I hear, every time I hear uh, one of my uh, betters uh, talk about brown values, mm. I cringe. Well, what are brown values? Bra well, brown University. Oh, yes, yes. University. Yes. Brown, brown University, university yes. values. The yes, university yes, yes. values. Well, we'll react to President Trump's latest uh, outrage yes. uh, consistent with Brown University values. Of uh, we, we, in response to student remonstration, uh, guarantee or ensure, assure that we will behave in a manner that's consistent with Brown University values. This is creepy. It okay. is. Uh, because it assumes agreement yes. about something. Okay? And by doing so, it excises or marginalizes argument, okay? Brown values. I'm not sure exactly. So at, in a meeting with my provost, it was a faculty meeting. 
I had a little tongue in cheek moment because we had uh, the potential of students, uh, graduate student unionization here at the university. Mm-hmm. There was going to be an election, right? So, so the question is, what's the posture of the university vis-a-vis the process before, before election in which the union is trying to persuade the graduate students to vote on behalf of unionization? So, of course, we are pro-labor, right? Because we would have to be, wouldn't we? On the other hand, being the employer in this case and knowing that it's a pain in the ass to have your graduate students unionized, we don't exactly want to encourage the activity. And so I raised my hand and I said, what do Brown University values dictate in this right. case? <laughs> exactly. So and, there the answer is far from clear. No, he stuffed, he stuffed it off. Is, he didn't. You're right about it. You're absolutely right, he Glenn. And it away. nailed it. You know, when, when a university has values about every, everything is included within their values, it, it excludes disagreement. It says anybody who disagrees is, doesn't belong here is an affront to our values. That's basically what the dean said about me. That is essentially what he said about me. But, of course, it gets more granular, okay? So if we were back in the era of apartheid, the university would have values vis-a-vis South Africa, and they would be on the, on the side of exterminating, uh, extirpating apartheid, and I'm not saying they would be wrong to be doing so. Uh, on the Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, you know, there are people who are going to say you have to side with the Palestinians. Uh, that, <laughs> you know, anti-Zionism is... A part of the, you know, of the progressive, and that's going to be controversial, obviously. Uh, you know, I, it uh, into there's everything. no university whose values would include support for Donald Trump or for the sentiments of the people who elected him. Mm-hmm. Not a single one. Now, that's creepy. Well, I mean, that's happened at our university. I mean, when, when he was proposing a travel ban and all of his immigration policies, our president sent out all of these emails. You know, we have to oppose this. We have to oppose that. Some of it was just pocketbook stuff. I mean, we rely on revenue from foreign students. You know, it was it just basic selfishness, which I can respect. But when you, when you start seeing it as a moral issue, it becomes very dangerous. Look, I think the universities need to scale back in many respects to something far more modest than they are. You know, they, they need to get rid of all the bureaucrats. They need to get rid of all these layers of administration, all the coddling, all the therapeutic crap. They just need to go back to this very simple model. And when someone like me expresses an opinion that a lot of people don't like, here's what the university dean and president should say. She's entitled to his or her opinion. You don't have to agree with her. Period. Nothing more needs to be said. I mean, I really don't understand why anything more ever is said. When students protested Camille Pally at the University of the Arts, the president, whose name is escaping me, he's not a famous person, he said exactly that. He said, we don't censor our professors, never have, never will. They're entitled to their opinion, and you're entitled to disagree with them. And it was, it was two sentences. Now, of course, that means that all the diversity and inclusion, you know, uh, busy buddies won't have anything to do. Amy, and that- <laughs> I got to tell you this. We're fellow travelers here. We, we're soulmates. I'm getting hate mail now. I was on uh, the news hour last night. Paul Salmon, uh, you know, understanding the economy, the series of uh, reports he does. He did one on reparations. Oh, my and, gosh. And I, I'm quoted saying it's a bad idea. Uh, and basically what I say is, first of all, you're going to divide the country up and you're going to call 35 million or so people black people. And then you're going to have some kind of dispensation vis-a-vis them that's uh, mediated by the state. Oh, why are you doing that? I mean, yeah, some of my ancestors were slaves. That's true. Some of my ancestors are also Irish uh, immigrants. I mean, why, why are you doing that? Why are you taking me? I'm a citizen. OK, and you're going to categorize me for the purpose of a, of a massive fiscal uh, administration, dispensation, social security. We're talking on that scale. We're talking trillions of dollars. I said, why are you doing that? I am, of course, a descendant of the slaves, but I'm many other things besides. We're in the 21st century. It was 150 years ago. Do you know it? And let me finish this point. Do you know what you're doing? I said that. I also said some people are doing poorly in the society and we should deal with their problems. Poverty is a problem. It should be addressed. I don't think there's any justification for addressing it more assiduously or with greater attention or urgency 
if the person is black than if they're white. What are you talking about? I said, okay. Do you know I'm getting hate mail? I'm not surprised. I'm being called a Sambo. Oh. A step and fetch it, Uncle Tom, in blackface. I'm literally, I'm not kidding. I'm worried about my physical safety. Well, yes, that is a concern. Um, Coleman Hughes, I was supposed to do a debate in New York. Coleman Hughes and I were arguing against reparations. I actually think they're Nuremberg-ian. I think they're really unseemly. But I just want to I, say that Coleman Hughes is the undergraduate uh, senior at, at Columbia, Columbia University. Yeah who testified before the House uh, yes, Committee on correct. Immigration There were issues. some prof- prof- professorial types on the other side, although they yeah. asked many people, and when they heard that Coleman and I were going to be on the other side, they said, no, thank you, uh, But which I consider fine. Oh, were you there? It didn't happen. Oh, they, okay. The, uh, it was called off because there were threats. Oh, and wow. some of them were threats of violence. And the conveners were very worried that they didn't have, you know, the resources to deal with those threats. So we didn't have a debate, Glenn. It, uh, we, we can't discuss it. There are so many things, Glenn, that we cannot discuss. And that's the goal. I mean, that is really the progressive left, I think, is an intellectual dead zone right now. Here's what they are obsessed with. Hunting down heretics, okay, labeling them punishing them, and if possible, excluding them. It kills them that they can't fire me. I mean, they could if they really wanted to, but it would be very difficult. Gosh. And I will tell you this, I don't know for sure, but if I did not have tenure, I would be long gone from the University of Pennsylvania. Maybe you disagree, but I no, can't. No, I don't, I don't disagree with that. Of course, you, because you're an embarrassment to them. Okay, it, and this you're is You're bad what, for the brand. This is our academic institutions today. And Glenn, we are spending. And and moreover, they could could placate the mob by giving the mob your head on a platter if they were able to do so. Well, Uh, they'd like to. Uh, You're not not the only one. There's a lot of stuff that's going on, Amy. uh, That, I mean, this idea about witch hunts and about the mobs looking for uh, people to string up. That's basically what you're talking about. I mean, metaphorically speaking, to string them up. I mean, I, I, think, the heretic I, think, I think the Me Too the thing also has some aspects of that, Amy. It does. It does. And I think that, you know, we've in, in forgetting about and pushing to one side due process and all of these Western values that we used to honor and revere, we are kind of sinking back into a less advanced state in the name of what? And here's the thing, Glenn. Since this little debacle has happened to me with the national conservatism, I've been approached by people on the street, okay? Some people of color. I talked to a doorman in New York the other day. He said, oh, you're Amy Wax. He said, I want you to answer me a question. Why are they trying to turn this country in the, into the place that we ran away from? Oh, wow. I don't, That's I'm not what I want to know. Right. I, I said, I have no answer for you. I have no answer for you. Another one said, well, I thought when Trump was elected, we could say whatever we wanted. Did you see my piece in the New York Times the other day? No, I didn't. On Al Sharpton. I asked if you saw my piece on Al Sharpton in the New York Times. Oh, I think that someone sent it to me, yeah. yeah. I, that, I, that I don't disagree with. Anyway, okay. you know, here's the thing that's going on. Yeah, the let's Democrats, wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Oh, yeah, let's wrap it up. The Democrats are fascinating because, as I said, they're, they're, you know, the crazies have taken over. And they have marched through the institutions. They, the progressives control the universities. They control Hollywood. They control the nonprofits, uh, journalism, uh, big business. Okay. I'll tell you one thing they don't control, and it drives them crazy. What happens in the voting booth? They can't reach in there. <laughs> they can't get in there. Well, I think you, therefore, are overlooking this whole uh, crisis about uh, restrictions on access to the ballot that Republicans are alleged to be perpetrating in state after state around this country. Well, this is a whole I, other I, let, me finish, Amy, let me finish, Amy. I think you missed the effort to uh, abolish the Electoral College because of the structural advantage it gives to the non-urban that. areas of the country. And, um, uh, you know, they're going to be lowering the voting age to 16 pretty soon. And you have to, I think, at least consider that some of this laxity about the border is a forward bet 
on 20 years from now what the electorate is going to look like. Sure. When people are celebrating that whites are becoming a minority in the electorate by a certain projected time, uh, I, I think uh, they're not out of the ballot box, not by a long shot. Well, that's the thing. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm overstating here in that there are a lot of different ways for them to, to skew what happens in the ballot box. There's a kind of a arms race going on here. No question about it. Uh, and I don't know what the future. I mean, I mean, let me just underscore this. Eric Holder leaves being attorney general of the United States and makes his campaign to be against gerrymandering. Why? Because while he and Obama were in office, the Democrats lost state legislature after state legislature. Now, why did they do that? Because when the voting was close to the people, the Democratic institutions produced majorities hostile to their program, okay? So now they don't want these legislatures to have as much influence over the way the congressional district look. I assure you that if Democrats were in control of two-thirds of the state houses, we wouldn't be hearing about the uh, profound threat to democracy that was constituted by gerrymandering. Of course. And this word, you know, this is the threat to democracy. This is undemocratic. That stuff gets thrown around you know, all the time. Can I make one more point? And I'm sorry to do this at the end of our conversation, but I've just been thinking about this a lot. Um, I remember Abigail Sternstrom's book, Whose Votes Count. I know you know the book. Yes, I do. She said in the face of the Voting Rights Act enforcement mechanism that was drawing majority minority districts, let's not constitute the American polity mainly on racial lines. Let's not think about representation in terms of that kind of association between the race of the uh, uh, representative and the race of the voter. That is not the way to construe voting rights. It's a mistake for this country. She lost that argument. Well, and, 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 it's a, and I believe it's a disaster. Here's what I'm trying to get at. I'm, I'm looking at this, the nature of racial politics, how it's shaping up, occasioned by this uh, contretemp over Trump's uh, criticism of Elijah Cummings and so forth about the Congressional Black Caucus, about who represents these districts, about how we think about uh, uh, black people having influence in the politics. And it's become um, uh, balkanized in a deeply disturbing way. We shouldn't be content with that. We shouldn't just take that as the, as, as the air and the water that we breathe without commentary. I'm, I'm prepared to reopen you know, the, 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 the notion that they destroyed the Voting Rights Act when the Supreme Court held that because a jurisdiction was racist in 1930 or 1960 doesn't mean that they have to have a special dispensation under the administration of, of elections forever. That's all they said. That's all they said. They said, come back with more contemporary evidence showing that these jurisdictions should be under this special dispensation. That's all they said. Okay. Well, the Supreme okay. Court has actually uh, partly agreed with you. And let me just say one thing. I mean, we could talk forever about voting, voting rights, which is a, a mess conceptually and otherwise, you know, about partisan gerrymandering, about racial gerrymandering. It's it's very complicated area. But I will say this, all right? Things are not as simple and they will continue to get more complicated. They are not as simple as they were because it's no longer a black-white thing. We have all sorts of other groups and constituency. And one real uh, sort of, you know, um, unknown, I guess you would call it, a monkey wrench in the system, is what, what will happen with Asians, right? So Asians and Indians, they now vote very democratic. And as I go around the country, I have had uh, Asians and Chinese people of, of Asian descent, various kinds, ask me, why the hell do Asians vote Democratic? I mean, they're coming to hear me. So, you know, they're, they're renegades in a way. Uh, what's going on? What's in it for them? I mean, a lot of the Democratic policies, like affirmative yeah. action, is bad for them. We've got the rebellion in New York City involving the exam schools where they're yeah. trying to get rid of the exam and a contingent of militant Asian parents saying, oh, no, you won't. And they defeated that, it. They defeated it. Yeah, for now. For now. OK, so all of I think the Asian constituency is a wild card. Uh, it is hard to know whether they will see the Democrats as their party or whether they will move right. Rayhan Salam, you know, who's very diplomatic and very politic, which I am very not, brilliant 
and very brilliant. He's the new president. People should know he's the new president of the Manhattan Manhattan. Institute. And this young man is uh, is a very, uh, very interesting fellow. Yeah, but anyway, he has an essay. I forget where it is. Might be a National Review or one of those places. Yeah. Where he tries to explain how Asians vote. And he says, well, here's one thing about Asians. And he's very nice about it. But he says, you know, they're, they're very conformist and they like to advance and they put their finger in the air and they look at where the elites are ideologically and how they vote, you know, like all the white progressive types at the top. And they say, well, if we want to curry favor with them, we're going to vote like them. Okay. And it's really kind of a skin deep opportunistic decision. Uh, And they don't think very hard about it, but when the progressive policies start hitting them and the meritocracy starts to be dismantled and you know, it's under constant pressure, Glenn, under constant pressure, uh, they might break ranks. Yeah, we, I agree. we don't know. I yeah. agree. So that's, that's a wild card. Well, we have this lawsuit at Harvard. Uh, Alex Bloom yeah. has been the legal entrepreneur kind of behind it, but the Asians are the plaintiffs. Um, I read Min Jo and Jennifer Lee's book, The Asian American Achievement Paradox. These are two sociologists who interviewed a couple uh-huh. hundred people in I've Southern California. It. Uh-huh. Uh, it's, it's uh, the cultural foundation. This is ammunition in your quiver, uh, Amy, I'm afraid to have to say. I have to give you this one. How are you going to not say culture? How are you going to say culture doesn't matter when you look at the Asians, the Asian American immigrants here? How are you going to say that? You can't really say that. I, I mean, uh, you can say it, but, but nobody, it's not very credible to say that. Uh, the the students them. told about these households that are sending these kids to Brown and Dartmouth and uh, MIT and Caltech and whatnot uh, at very high astronomical rates uh, is a, uh, uh, in terms of allocation of time, in terms of what's valued, in terms of uh, the structure of family and, and parenting, the respect and discipline, deference to elders, uh, in terms of social institutions, in terms of reinforcement uh, and whatnot. There's no surprise really that these kids are doing so well given what we can see about their backwards. You can't tell me that doesn't matter. Jesus. I mean, come on. That's, that's like avoiding reality. So that's a, that's a kind of micro. On the other hand, on the other hand, I would not explain, uh, at least not in a straightforward way, the rapid rise in the post-World War II, and this is contrary to your global uh, civilizational comparative point, uh, uh, success of the Asian economies. I'm talking about Korea. I'm talking about Singapore. I'm talking about Hong Kong. We talked about Japan. One want, doesn't want to overlook China. Uh, and, uh, or uh, India at a different uh, pace and in a different way. Uh, I wouldn't attribute that uh, in some stick figure kind of simplistic way to cultural differences. I wouldn't deny for a minute that culture has some role to play, but it's a complex historical process involving a lot of stuff that I would want to study very, very carefully before I came to any essentializing conclusions. <laughs> Well, let me just, we'll close, but let me add one more thing coming okay, back. Okay, you can close with this. I'll let you have the last word. And voting uh, and, and, you know, being stuck back in the, in the 50s and 60s on voting rights, although the Supreme Court has turned back some of that and, and as and partisan gerrymandering, the challenge, getting the words involved in that, they've rejected. But the Hispanic population is also another big chunk of the voting population, uh, and they... You know, who knows how that's going to play out because it's a fairly heterogeneous population, relatively speaking. I, uh, right now, they are solidly in the Democratic camp. They're big government people. They Except are for the Cubans. People. The Cubans are not solidly yeah, Democratic. The Cubans, right, so the Cubans aren't. Um, and, and so that whole paradigm under the Voting Rights Act seems to be obsolete in a way. Yeah. Uh, that's my last word. Okay, last word, Amy Wax, uh, professor of law, University of Pennsylvania. You've been here with me at the Glenn Show. A controversialist, can I call you that? Is that is that an epithet? Uh, no, I'm just trying to figure out like what's going on, Glenn. You know, the Chronicles of Higher Education. <laughs> they, I got to tell you this. They asked me if you were a racist. Oh. I said, no, come on, that's ridiculous. She's not a racial provocateur. Is as far as I would go with that. Okay. <laughs> So uh, thanks for your time, Amy. It's been enjoyable talking to you. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Thank you. Bye-bye.